we're going to do two different things, but um, we were going to discuss the Ways and Means Amendment on H-107. We got a run through on what the differences were between their bill and our bill. Um, but they, the appropriations is, is still working on an amendment, which is why we're not going to see Damien immediately. Um, they are looking to vote H-107 out of appropriations as soon as today, but um, we won't know. So if Damien is relatively quick next door, he may pop his head in back and forth. He's also needed downstairs because the Senate Committee on Government Operations is busy voting out or working on last words on uh, a bill that would affect uh, registration of burn pit victims from from the Middle East, which we will get. Um, it has been given dispensation for crossover, so we will get that bill when the Senate passes it through. So Damien has to be in about three different places this afternoon. We may not see much of him. Um, in the meantime, we'll have Joyce here to talk about some of the analyst analysis of of S23. Um, Matt Barowitz, who testified last week, was um, followed up on our questions and provided some material. Not, I haven't looked at it, so I don't know if it addresses everything that we asked for. Um, so this might be a little bit of a, you know, if we do see, if we do see um, Damien, we can ask him better what he thinks his schedule is going to be. I, Ron, did you get a, did you get a, anything clearer from from him about his time? Uh, just that he's gonna he has a few minutes now, but then he was gonna go to GovOps uh, for the uh, S one eleven, which is the burn pit bill. And he would possibly, depending on what's going on next door, just check in with us real quickly. All right, so we might have just a weird afternoon here after a long couple of weeks. So um, he did just send me a short summary of, that I'm just posting now, of uh, 107. What's he just, posting? Uh, it just says a short summary. Um, a short summary is recommended by Ways and Means of the bill. OK. All right, well, we'll hold off on that for just a minute. Um, all right, so Joyce, please join us in a different hat that you've been. <laughs> well, you started with, you started here on S23. Yes, yes, but all morning I've been doing paid family leave, so if I start spouting, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the record. I'm Joyce Manchester with the fiscal office, and we're going to continue today with the preliminary notes that I began presenting last week. Are you running the I, I have it up right behind you now. I've got any questions on my copy. Okay, so uh, should we review or do you all remember where we're going with this? <laughs> I think we remember. I agree. Okay, yeah. generally speaking, this is the bill that would raise the minimum wage from 1078, where we are now to $15 an hour in 2024, and there's a relatively smooth path to get there. And remember, we talked about nominal dollars and why it's important to sometimes think in inflation-adjusted dollars and all that sort of thing. Okay, so I'm on section six, I think. What does the new modeling effort tell us? <coughs> Okay, now why is a new modeling effort important? You remember that back in 2017, we had a summer fall study committee on raising the minimum wage. And at that time, uh, Tom Covett and Nick Rockler and Associates did some modeling of various paths. Um, last year, we had a revision in the path for the minimum wage and we basically did some interpolation. We took the modeling results from the previous fall, which had gone to $15 in 2022, I believe, and we basically <coughs> massaged them to represent what we thought would happen. 
uh, if the minimum wage went to $15 in 2024. But that was all based on older data and the older version of the model and so forth. So we felt this winter, spring, it was important to, to ask the model to do its thing with an updated set of data on wages in Vermont and, and employers and so forth, and also with the updated version of the model. So we have those new results, and I'm going to slowly get into those results. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. That's good. Let's sit. <laughs> Just doesn't want to turn. So it has to be facing this way. Sure, it's fine. Good? Good. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Okay, so eventually we're going to find out that the model results did not change much. Uh, part of the reason for this is that the model used by uh, Ben and Rockler is the Remy model. It's sort of an input-output model, it's a bit of a dynamic model, but basically it views the economy as being on a steady keel and it imposes policy changes on that steady model, uh, I'm sorry, steady economy, and looks at the difference between the economy with the policy change and without the policy change. So in fact, whether the current unemployment rate is 2.9% or 2.4% or 3.5% isn't that important to the results that you get out of the model. What matters is the change between the economy that's in the model and the economy with the policy change in the model. Okay, so you're just looking at policy changes over time. And REMI again stands for? Ah, Regional Economic Model Inc, I believe. Okay. Like and this is something that is a standard, um, standard for tool used all over the country for many different types of policy changes. But trying to apply some form of apples to apples, at least on a base scale. Oh yes, and there's lots of detailed uh, data that go into the model. Uh, lots of uh, thinking about how policy changes would affect wages, behavior, prices, you know, all those economic things. Okay, so I've just told you that the Remy model relies on a baseline economy devoid of business cycle effects and imposes a policy change on that baseline economy. So the effects of the increase in the minimum wage do not look much different in the model itself, except that what's being modeled this year is a little bit steeper because we're starting one year later than last year. Right? So uh, you can see in the picture that the red line is S23, the current version of the bill. And what we were looking at last year was S40, the green line that started rising a little bit sooner. So the, the changes were a bit more gradual. Now we have a little bit steeper slope. OK, so I mentioned earlier that, that the model can now look at updated data sources. So they now use the American Community Survey 2012 to 2016. So you have to, when you're dealing with Vermont, you usually have to use a five-year average because Vermont is such a small state that the um, sampling <coughs> each year is a very small number. So you want to group the sampling together over five years and then take an average. Okay, and they also use the Occupational Employment Survey, which is a actually U.S. DOL um, survey of employers. Um, the most recent one for Vermont is 2017 now. So those data sources were both updated. And again, just to, <coughs> I think I'll reiterate it here, so the, the analysis that was done for 2012 to 2016 differed from the previous one that gave us the 0.93% because that came in from, a, from an earlier set that included the recession. Wait, the 0.93 is paid family leave, isn't it? Yes, I'm sorry I confused that automatically for you. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, so the, but, but I'm sorry, so for this, for this data too, I mean, so for this data, the previous assumptions were being made on a set of years that were, that included recession, is that right? Four or? years of recession, that's right. Okay. That's right, so now we've kind of moved a little bit out. And this, that's the point of this picture that I'm going to show you now. If you look at inflation-adjusted Vermont GDP growth, 
Previously, they were using 2011 to 2015, and you can see that it included 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. Uh, all of those years were closer to being in recession, right? And we've now shifted to the right, to the red uh, lines. So we're now a little bit further away from the recession. So uh, that's good. Okay, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about the consensus forecasts. So if you think about unemployment and how unemployment looked in Vermont, uh, the earlier forecast from December of 2016, this is the consensus forecast, the administration and the legislative economists. So this is Kavet uh, and Jeff Carr. Uh, December 2016, they were looking at a little bit higher unemployment rate. And as of December 2018, it's the lower green, dark, dark green line. Uh, so, so the economy is looking a little bit stronger. Okay, and employment growth in Vermont looks quite different, actually. This is kind of interesting. So as of December 2016, you can see that they were expecting quite strong employment growth. That blue line was going up over the, the uh, hill there. But by December 2018, I think demographics were catching up to us and the uh, employment growth is thought to be a little bit slower. But they ended up in nearly the same place. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Not quite sure why. Something happened in 2016, 2017. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not sure why. OK, and now. Yeah, but it's not that different. These are growth rates, right? So instead of a 1.5% growth rate, they're talking about a 0.4% growth rate. So it's a growth rate, not a number. Um, so I'm talking about minimum wage. Hi. Hello. Did you think I was talking about paid family wage? No. No? You're all, all on board. Mm -hmm. And you, you saw I said something. Oh, you did? Yes. Representative Mush. So uh, do you know how uh, our graphs and how our unemployment situation looks in comparison to other states. Oh, we are very low relative to other states. Right. Our unemployment rate is 2.4 percent, I believe. It may have been updated recently, but uh, last I know it was 2.4 percent, which is very low. I think this, the nationwide uh, unemployment rate is what 2.8, 2.9 percent, which is also very low. Uh, but we're even lower than that. And what about the economic growth? Uh, let's see. I do not have economic growth on the tip of my tongue. I know that generally speaking, in recent quarters, Vermont's economic growth has been a bit lower than the na nationwide average. Um, I'm guessing it's uh, one and a half to two percent, but uh, we can check easily online when we have a minute. Okay. Thank you. And what's considered? I What's considered a healthy unemployment rate, or what's because at some point it kind of backs up on itself? Yes, absolutely. So, in the old days, uh, <laughs> before this recent expansion, it used to be that 4% unemployment was sort of standard full employment unemployment, right? Mm -hmm. So, that's the unemployment rate at which it was thought there would be very little pressure on prices to rise. So that's 4%. Now, I would think that people are rethinking that benchmark because our economy is now at, what, 2.9%, something like this, unemployment, and we're not seeing a lot of, of inflation pressures. So whether this is a temporary thing or whether this is you know, the new normal, I'm not ready to say. I don't, I don't know that there's a consensus out there. Right, but it's causing people to it's very low. I mean, yes, conventional absolutely. wisdom was 4%. Right. And, right. Um, and what about, how does that work in terms of, we talked a little bit about last week what, about people who are out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, has that number changed along with the 2.5%? So I know nationwide there has been a resurgence of folks who were out of the labor force coming back in, and that has been part of what's keeping wages down. Because if you don't have enough bodies, either you have to find bodies from the woodwork or you have to raise wages, right? And so far, there have been enough folks coming in from out of the workforce to 
become part of the workforce so that wages have not had to rise very much. It wasn't, I seem to remember testimony a couple of years ago on this that, or perhaps it was last year, where we thought that some people were coming back into the workforce because the minimum wage was going up. I think in the old days, we used to judge inflation, we used to judge jobs, unemployment on higher paying jobs. And now that there's, now that so much manufacturing is overseas and there's less in the United States, I mean, these are all very general statements. Um, but that I seem to remember hearing testimony last year that that people were coming, some of those people who had not been seeking work were coming back into the workforce because wages are, at the, at the service level at least, are increasing. And so I'm not aware of that testimony, but it, it okay. sounds plausible. Um, uh, it's also true that people know that the economy is doing better, and so they believe they have a better chance of finding a job when they come back in to look for a job, right? They hear that the economy is growing, and so they're more optimistic that they'll be able to find work, so that's part of it, too. Um, and of course, during a recession, everybody knows that the unemployment rate is very high, that it's very difficult to, to find jobs and so forth. So there's lots of factors that go into a person's decision to come back into the workforce. Yes. OK, so now we're going to move to the big table two. Now, uh, table two, for those of you who are around, who were around last year, was uh, part of the fiscal note that accompanied um, S40 last year. Um, what I'm showing you here is the results from S40, where those results are in black and are marked old. <laughs> and then uh, the new results for S23 that come from the new modeling effort are in blue and on the right. Okay, And I do not anticipate including both sets of results in the new fiscal note. I will include the new results. But for some of you who are around last year, it might be helpful to see that things have changed a little bit, but not very much from last year. Okay. Now, one thing to note is the years that I'm showing. So last year, when I was looking at S40, the first year of change was 2019, right? And then we looked at 2019, 2020, and the $15 year, which was 2024. And this year, the change starts in 2020. So I'm showing you 2020 and 2021, and also 2024, which is the year again in which we reach $15 an hour. Okay. So the, uh, the outcomes are explained down the left-hand side of the table. And I will walk through these and, and mostly talk about the new results. If there are questions about the new results relative to the old results, we can try to address those as well. But I think you should be interested in the new results now, right? And that's, that's what would apply for S23. OK, and I should also mention, yeah, now I hope this doesn't cause trauma. But um, the results for the old bill, S40, last year were presented in 2018 dollars because back then we were in 2018 and we were using 2018 dollars, okay? It did not make sense to me to present this year's results in 2018 dollars because we're now in 2019, okay? So I'm presenting old results in 2018 dollars, new results in today's dollars, 2019 dollars, all right? So, if you want to do the translation, you can multiply $2018 by 2.5%. Increase them by 2.5%, because that's expected inflation between 18 and 19. Okay? And one more clarification. It takes a while to get this. So, so using that top line, when, I, when we see that in 2024, it says 25%, um, I'm sorry, the second line, the share of jobs. So when it says that 21.8% of the jobs in 2024, on the far right corner, um, that's the number of jobs now, or the change, the, the percentage change of jobs that are between the minimum wage and $15 an hour. Is that right? So that's the share of jobs now at less than $13.43, which remember is today's value of $15 an hour in 
Okay. okay. So it's as if, with my magic wand, I could change the minimum wage to $13.43 today and then ask how many jobs are paying at or below the minimum wage. And the answer would be about 22%. And today they're at today they're at thirty one nine and or twenty six seven or whatever that's at, or whatever whatever that is next year will be. That's the min that's how many jobs would be at the equivalent. So you're looking at the third line. Yeah. Okay. So this says that if the minimum wage were to rise to what was the number eleven dollars and fifty cents in twenty twenty. Uh, there would be 26,770 jobs at 1150 or less. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm sorry, I didn't so You jumped down three jumped lines. Down. <laughs> okay, so the first line simply tells you that the percentage change is probably the percentage change from 2018, uh, actually 2019 minimum wage, inflation adjusted. So you've seen these numbers before because we looked at the, the inflation adjusted proposed minimum wage last week. So it's an increase of 4% in 2020, a 9% increase in 2021, and a 25% increase by 2024. So that shows you the jump in the inflation adjusted minimum wage relative to current law. Okay. All right, line two. We've now talked about this already. The approximate share of jobs at less than the proposed minimum wage. Oh yes, DOL basis. Okay, so the Department of Labor looks at the number of jobs, not the number of people employed in minimum wage jobs. Okay, and this all makes sense because the Department of Labor talks to employers, right? And they say, how many jobs do you have at this wage? How many jobs do you have at this wage? So they're looking at jobs. They do not know if one person is working three jobs in different places or five jobs or one job or whatever, right? So this is the number of jobs that pay less than the proposed minimum wage, okay? And we know that um, minimum wage workers, well, low wage workers on average have 1.5 jobs, 1.6 jobs, something like this. So many minimum wage job, no, many minimum wage workers have more than one job. Okay. Approximate number of jobs at less than the pros minimum wage, and again, this is the DOL counting jobs, not people. So by 2024, about 66,440 jobs will be paying at or less than the proposed minimum wage, $15 an hour. All right. Now, the initial wage bill change as a share of total wages and salary. Okay. Think of all the wages earned by people at or below the minimum wage, and then think of all wages and salaries in the economy. So if you think of how much that minimum wage uh, total wage bill is going to change as a share of total wages and salaries, the answer is 1.1% by 2024. Okay, so that tells you how much it tells you that, in fact, minimum wage workers, as a share of all wages out there in Vermont, are only getting a little tiny extra piece of the pie. Okay. With this proposed wage. With increase. the change. Yeah. Good. And the next line tells you, in aggregate, what's the initial income gain of low wage workers? And the answer is by 2024, they will gain $196 million. Okay, so that's extra money in the pockets of minimum wage workers. And that represents just 1.1% of the total. Right. That change is 1.1% of the total wages and salaries. Okay, and these are all numbers that pop out of Remy. So, um, yeah, and yeah, Remy was very much adjusted to fit the Vermont economy. So, Remy has a much better idea of what's going on than I do. Let's just say that. Okay, now, 
have we talked about the fact that the state budget is going to both gain and lose money as a consequence of raising the minimum wage? I'm not sure we've actually talked about that this year. Not quite like that. We've talked about the benefit cliffs. We've talked mm -hmm. about. Yeah, okay, so that's all related, right? Yeah. Okay. So first realize that if minimum wage workers are earning higher wages, they will then pay higher income taxes on those wages, right? So there will be some gains in terms of increased tax revenue. They might also be able to buy a used car more frequently or you know, more clothing for their kids or you know, clothing isn't tax, so that's a bad example. Uh, but anyway, if they're able to buy more goods and services all of those things add up to a little bit more tax revenue for, um, for the state budget. At the same time, those minimum wage workers, because they're earning more, may be eligible for lower benefits, right? And that means that the state doesn't have to pay out so much in benefits, uh, child care uh, assistance program, uh, reach up, uh, fuel assistance, all of those low-wage uh, programs provided by the state. So the balance is a net fiscal gain to the state of 17 million by 2024. Okay. Representative Clark. Last year you, you showed us the benefits clip, and you said there was an exemption <coughs> to smooth that out. So that has been. Is that that is this as well? It is not. No. Um, so this is a result of the modeling prior without that okay. fix in it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, is it safe to say that this money that is in people's pockets that uh, they were expected to be spending in the economy will have an impact carried over to corporate taxes or business tax revenues increase? So it is true that that is all incorporated in the Remy model. Uh -huh. um, I, uh, you know, we were asked previously if there would be an impact on GDP in the early years. It's so small that it's not discernible. Okay. Um, eventually we're going to get to the long-term effects and we will see that there's a tiny, tiny effect on GDP. Okay. Thank you. So again, this is something that if the, the, that $17 million figure is the result of having paid a higher wage that, uh, again, the, the increase to the state through tax revenue and decreased. Lower right, so if I've, if I've gone up a level, even even with the changes that Deb Brighton showed us in, in say, this child care, moving it up the ladder so a little those bit. Those are not included here. Okay. Because in part, what we're trying to do here is to figure out if the state is gaining enough revenue from the minimum wage changes to pay for the moving out the, the cliff in the CCPAP program. And I believe her testimony on that was yes. Yes, yes it is. Right. You can see in, even in the first year, the gain is about $4.5 million. So the, again, the economic theory, such as it is here, is by increasing the wages, we're increasing taxes, lowering mm -hmm. benefits in order to pay greater benefits to the people who do qualify. Correct. Right. Okay, so that's the good news, that the state gains, what, 17 million by 2024. Now the bad news is that the state also loses a significant amount of revenue from the federal government. And again, that's because federal benefits are going to go down primarily Medicaid, right, that, that targets low-income folks. Um, also food stamps, which is a federal program. Uh, what else is based on low-income? I think those are the two biggies. Could be LIHEAP, could be... Could be LIHEAP, which is federal, right. And also, <laughs> folks are paying increased federal taxes because their income has gone up due to the increase in their wages, okay? So when you add all those things together, the net reduction 
in federal funds to Vermont's economy is about $63 million by 2024. And that's simply a result of boosting low-wage workers in terms of their income. So they're paying more federal taxes, they're receiving fewer federal benefits. But that's, and that's what people do in a, in a world where there's, we think that people go up in salary anyway. Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. I mean, this is a, it's, it's, a not, it's bad news only in that it's money taken from the pot, but it also represents the social mobility that we expect increased wages to do. Absolutely. Yes. But it is a consequence for our economy that will show up a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, Tom Cabet likes the term disemployment. And I'm sorry about that, but he is quite um, consistent that disemployment is the word to use. So, approximate net disemployment is just telling you the number of jobs that could be lost, okay? So it's about 90 jobs in the first year and it ramps up to about 800 jobs by 2024. So that says that all across the Vermont economy, there might be 800 fewer jobs relative to baseline, okay? So this does not say that we're now at whatever, 300,000 jobs and we're gonna drop down by 800. It says we're now at 300,000, we would expect a small increase over time and by the time we get to 2024, if this uh, increase in the minimum wage passes, we'd expect to be 800 below where we would have been. Okay? And this is not 800 people losing their jobs. This is 800 fewer jobs. Just the way, going back to what we, we talked about earlier, we're 21.8% right. of our jobs right. are, are, are minimum wage and below jobs. And so this is just saying, and again, we talked a little bit about, for, for whatever number of reasons, it could be part of, we can't judge it on population loss, right, of, of the working force that we've talked about, but this is just saying it's possible that the jobs are, are it's possible that the jobs are being lost because someone's not working 1.6 jobs anymore, they might be working 1.2 jobs, or mm -hmm. those jobs just may change sure. or not be available. Right. So this sort of takes into account change in hours, change in jobs, all those things, mushes it together into about 800 jobs. Right. And that's, I mean, that's, an, that's a well under 1%. Mm -hmm. But, but, but are you saying it's cause of it? It's because of the increase in the wage? This is because trade? of the policy because. change. Right. Yeah, right? That, I mean, that, <clears throat> we sort of isolated the economy on a steady state baseline, yeah. and we've just imposed <clears throat> this minimum wage change to see what happens. Okay. And the result is we are down about 800 jobs relative to baseline in 2024. Okay? Now, it's very, it's, it's very common for people to say, you know, we've lost 800 jobs, or, you know, we have 800 fewer jobs than we have today. No, that's not right. It's 800 fewer than would have been present at base in the baseline economy. So there could still be a net positive. Could still there be could net be positive. a net positive. Who knows? There could be a right. net negative. Right. Right. But again, the important part is jobs, not people. That's also true. Yes. Okay. Shall we move on to the long run? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so the bottom of the table talks about long-run, long-term, I use the term, long-term outcomes. So this is a little bit hard for people to get in their heads. So, um, so we're thinking about 2025 to 2040, which is a 15-year period, right? It's a long period of time. And things are going to be happening in the economy. There are going to be business cycles, and there are going to be ups and downs, and blah, 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 blah. But this is an attempt to say, if you could average out all those little fluctuations over time, think about a steady baseline economy chugging along through time, and now impose that policy change, and where do you end up? Do you end up a little bit above where you would have been in the long-term baseline, or do you end up a little bit below? Okay? So the first result here talks about the net Annual long-term disemployment, and again, this is the number of jobs, and I'm sorry I have to use the term disemployment, <laughs> but here we are. Okay, so this says, on average, if you think about the economy chugging along, because of this minimum wage uh, policy change, 
there would be about 1,845 fewer jobs in the economy each year. It does not say you're losing 1,845 jobs each year, right? That this is commonly, I just saw this in, in a news story last week. It is not right. <laughs> what you want to think of is 18, 1,845 fewer jobs than would have been in the economy in each year, right? Okay? Every year you're below where you would have been. No, no, I understand that. So I, I guess, my, I'm sorry, but I guess my question is, you said 1,800 each year? Or Every in the year. grand total of the 15? No, 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 each year okay. you're 1,845 jobs below where you would have been. Correct. So if you were at 300,000 jobs under baseline, yes. now you're at 292. So is that a sustained number or a repetitive retraction every year? The difference is this is is on average, on average is yes. 1845. Annually. But Each is that year. but is that like a repetitive net Each, retraction? No. Okay, no, no, it's just no, sustained. No. The difference between where we are under minimum wage and where we would have been under the baseline is 1845. That's the difference. Yes. Right, it's not 1845 a year, it's not. <coughs> That's what I'm saying, that, yeah, I guess. The difference is, on average, 1845. Okay. Over That's like a flat word. It does not mean you're losing 845 jobs every year. No, I understand it's, it's not, not lost, but it's like, just non-existent. It's, it's lower than you would have been, right? Yes. Yeah, it's extrapolating the 800 a little bit. Uh, for, for right, there. and things do accumulate over time, right? People who are able to stay in business, fast food, Restaurants, for example, who were able to stay in business for five years, maybe after 10 years, went out of business. Okay, that's why you want to look at the long term. Right, and in 15 years, I mean, I'm gonna just use my age again as a, as a bellwether for the baby boom, for the end of the baby boom, or 55. In 15 years, let's just say 70, hopefully most of the baby boomers are out of the workforce except by choice that makes a different impact, that that's gonna be a whole different impact than, than these are. not captured here, right. right. So this is steady economy, and then impose a policy change, and where do you end up? You end up 1,845 jobs lower than you would have been whatever the baseline economy is doing. Right, which has nothing to do with the size of the workforce. Right, right. Okay. That might be right sized just cause. Right, if there's a drop in the, but we don't, we don't have those numbers today. Unknown. Okay, and in the long term, what is disemployment as a share of total jobs? And the answer is 0.4 percent. Okay, so he says that, that the number of jobs will be 0.4 percent lower than it would have been on average over those 15 years. Okay, is that clear? This is really important because so many people don't understand and therefore misstate the effect. And it sounds much worse than it than it really is. If, if you don't like the word disemployment, you I would say net job loss. No. Um, okay, so then we have disemployment as a share of total jobs. Why, why is that the same as the above line? This is a problem. Clearly the uh, scribe, that would be me, has a problem. <laughs> oh, one is supposed to be as a share of uh, as a share of low wage jobs. So it's two point eight percent of uh, let's see, two point eight percent of low wage jobs have been lost. Right? We're down two point eight percent of low wage jobs. We're down 04 percent of total jobs. Okay? So I need to fix that clearly. So that 2.8% difference, I think there are two ways of looking at it. There are 2.8% fewer low-wage jobs because now they're in a higher category? Uh, or just, they just aren't there anymore? I think that's they're not the 18, there. That's what the 1845 yeah. represents. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they're mm -hmm. gone. The people are still there. The people have moved up, right? That's that's a good thing. But there are fewer jobs in that low, low wage category. Yeah. Uh, what 
impact has jobs going overseas, um, uh, mechanization, are they all factored in here? Or? That's all part of the baseline, right? That's happening regardless okay. of a change right. in the minimum yeah. wage. Right, so that's but it all is. part of the baseline. Okay. Yeah. And again, part of that loss of jobs that could, I mean, from a human perspective, that could go from someone going from 1.6 jobs to 1.2 jobs. So that's, which you can do if you're making a higher, theoretically, if you're making a higher wage, you would work less hours in order to make the wage you were making before. Yeah. I, I, I understand it's jobs and not people, but can this show people as well? So, or no, is that impossible? That's a common question. Um, so Deb Brighton and Tom Cavett are the folks who try to make that translation. And they would say that if on average a low-wage worker works 1.5 jobs, you could think about this as, you know, divide by 1.5. But of course, it's not going to be the same, it's not going to be one person who currently works 1.5 jobs who loses that job, right? So it's spread these jobs are spread across more people. Well, who loses a job and works fewer doesn't hours. Doesn't work as much. Works fewer jobs. hours. Yeah. Right. Represent lawsuits. I'm coming back to the two point eight percent. Excuse me. Yes. But isn't there an issue there because the definition of a low wage job is going to change sure. as the wage scale changes? No, this is this is relative to. Uh, well. So I can't say for sure if this is at the new minimum wage and below or if this takes into account of, there was a, a wider range that was used for some of the analysis and I'm not 100% sure if that's used here or not. But at some point there was the possibility that this minimum wage change would flow through to, to slightly higher paying jobs, mm -hmm. right? And that's called the uh, spillover or something. So it may be that these low-wage jobs include uh, jobs that pay up to, let's say, $19 an hour, $20 an hour, whatever. And, and They're low-wage jobs. Mean, the definition of a low-wage right. job might change Goes. because the scale's moving. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at low-wage jobs. Yes. Okay. Shall we move on to GDP? Please. <laughs> So, as you know, gross domestic product, or GDP, is the value of all goods and services produced in the Vermont economy. And the question is, what happens to the level of Vermont GDP? So we are not talking about the growth rate. We are talking about what's the total amount of goods and services produced in Vermont under current law, and what would be the total amount of goods and services produced in Vermont after this change in the minimum wage. Okay. And the answer, according to the model, is that Vermont GDP would be a bit lower by 0.28%. Okay, so the negative effect is there, but it's very small. And it's probably stemming mostly from the reduction in federal funds flowing into the state. There's also some negative effect from the loss of jobs. So some people are going to be without that income that lets them spend and uh, help the Vermont economy, right? So again, that's 0.28% of what it of level. would be. That's right. So if there was a GDP, what is our normal GDP? What is an average GDP for us? Billions of dollars. It's, uh, that's a knowable number. But I'm just saying that if it were going to be $100 or whatever, um, if it were $100, then it would be basically ninety-nine seventy-two or something Correct. like that um, under this under this scenario. That's right. So it would still go up, or it would still exist. It would just be changed oh, by this much. Right. Just the same ex explanation as you had for the amount being the disemployed job. Exactly right. Vermont GDP. Does someone have this already? Twenty-six, a little less than. Billion. billion. Yeah, 26 billion. So if we take, uh, can we do this? Have you done the math already? I have 
Okay, so this requires me to put in lots of zeros. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you want to know or not? No, no, no I'm just like, just get yeah, sure there's a baseline small. versus, right, so this doesn't, this doesn't take a GDP if it were measured in a percentage basis of 3.2% of minus 2.28%. It just, it's shaving the 0.28 off of whatever does exactly happen. Under baseline, right. And GDP doesn't, it only measures, it doesn't measure. Home production, for example. Does not measure home production. So if, if some, if, well, the usual example is the wife who stays at home, right? If she cooks all of the family's meals, the value of her time and her cooking skills and so forth is not measured. If she goes off to be a chef at a restaurant and she gets paid for that, then the value of her skills and her time and so forth is included in GDP. So it's an imperfect measure, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, we had this conversation earlier today about the basic needs budget. It's imperfect, but it's what we have, I think is one of the ways that we have to do business here. Yes. But this seems completely insignificant. So it's small, it's controversial because there are many different ways to look at the effects of the minimum wage. Some people would say it should increase the value of GDP. Someone, some people would say it's likely to have a bigger negative effect on GDP. So there are different ways of looking at this. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of a small but slightly negative effect. Have there been any studies that have yet have been done or comparisons that have been done against, um, for instance, in our Connecticut River Valley, we so constantly talk about the differences between Connecticut, uh, not Connecticut, but New Hampshire and Vermont. But since we've gone to 1050 and New Hampshire hasn't, I know we've seen, what, I know when I go to the McDonald's in Lebanon, or West Lebanon, they're advertising people to work at our minimum wage. Right. Um, have there been any studies that have shown the difference in, in uh, any economic study of worth that, that would measure the plus or minus of having the difference in, in the minimum wage? Or is that just going to be in the case of the borders? The, you know the, the <coughs> upper valley is that just something that we um, that we notice and say um, oh look they're tr they're paying their people as much as they're paying here and uh, it, it doesn't seem to matter to us as as much as it would for the service economy on on the New Hampshire side but I've heard in the past we're going to get our we're going to get our lunch eaten if we pay our people too much and that's something that it, it's uh, out there yes so. Um, so this is a complicated area. Um, it is true that the New Hampshire House just passed a minimum wage bill that would raise their minimum wage to $12 an hour by 2022. So they are feeling some pressure to increase wages for their low, lowest paid workers. Um, so that's interesting. We'll see if it goes through the Senate and the governor may veto it anyway in New Hampshire. So we'll see what happens there. Um, there have been a number of attempts to try to look at the significance of the big wage differential between New Hampshire and Vermont. Tom Cabet, you might remember, did a study for the Summer Study Committee back in 2017. Unfortunately, the bottom line is that there are so many factors other than just the minimum wage differential that differ across the border that it's really hard to pinpoint what's going on. They have very different land use rules, for example. Um, they allow big box stores, and Vermont does not, and uh, you know, big box stores tend to hire low-paid workers, and so you would expect to see more low-paid workers on that side of the border in the big box stores. So there are many, many factors that have to go into the, the uh, determination of what's going on, so it's, it's really tough to say. But it is true that in general, markets work. And if you can't find a worker at 725, which is the minimum wage in New Hampshire, then you raise the wage until you can attract a worker to your place of, place of business. And so it turns out that in Lebanon, they end up paying uh, Vermont's minimum wage, or, or even better. You know, sometimes you see $12 an hour uh, on those fast food restaurant 
signs. So, uh, you know, people adjust, markets adjust, things happen. I'm going to check in with Damien, who is much desired this afternoon. Yeah. And so, um, how long do we have before? What's your, what does your afternoon look like? Uh, I told them I'd be back around 2.15. And that's just next door? They're talking to Commissioner Petrak, yeah. Or they're going to be in a couple minutes. So, um, that I think they're only going to need him to talk to him for about 15 minutes. So, and then you'll um, be back. Or do you have to go downstairs? Back. No, I'm done downstairs. Uh, they voted S111. It will be coming here presumably early next week. Uh, so, um, and that uh, that is a veterans bill. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, Joyce, I think we're at the end of that preliminary presentation. Yes. Thank you. Um, Damien, I don't think we could deal with 107 today. Okay. I, I just, I just, let's just yep. stick with minimum wage. And we asked you to come in and start just walking through the existing minimum wage statute. Yeah, so I could, I've got a PowerPoint on that. Um, we can start and see how far we get. There's lots to talk about. Um, and uh, you also have Dirk Anderson and Jared Adler from the department here. Um, who may be able to offer some tidbits about some of the things that we'll talk about in the statute too. So, okay. um, so this is to going to be his, you guys up, so this is just going to be an historical look at the minimum wage statute. Um, we don't often do this, but I just think for this bill in particular, even with what's in the bill that exists, that it would be worth our while to understand the, con the context of what we're working with. If people have their hard copies. Yeah. And Damien, you said you had a PowerPoint? I uh, do. I'm going to pull it up and we'll get going. <coughs> I think I do. I can measure tweets, cut down, but I can't measure like the happiness of you know a son or something like that. Yeah, laughing for the children. Everything except that. Paper there. Thanks. Some of that signature there. Yeah. Does anyone else see? Yeah. 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 Damian Leonard, Legislative Council. Um, so what I'll do is kind of walk you through Vermont's wage and hour statutes. And I want to just be clear here. There are two subchapters. One is subchapter two, which, which relates to how and when you have to send people their paychecks and what the remedies are if you don't actually give the person a paycheck. The other one is what I'm referring to as the wage and hour statutes, which is our minimum wage subchapter which is subchapter three of chapter five, title 21. And that covers what's the minimum wage, what do you do for overtime, and then uh, there are some rather dated references in there to, for example, the wage board, uh, which I believe the last member of the wage board, according to Steve Monaghan, passed away in the early 80s. So uh, that will give you an idea of how outdated some of the language is. Um, and retired. I assume so at that point. Um, but uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the old rules that are left over in here that are vestiges of the 1950s when our law was adopted. So a uh, little historical background. Uh, our wage and hour statutes were enacted in Act 303 of 1957. 
They were modeled on the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, the original minimum wage was 75 cents an hour, which was increased to a dollar per hour in 1959. And I need to just say here, for those of you who were with us last year, I cited the dollar an hour in 1959 as our first minimum wage in Vermont, and I was wrong. It was 75 cents an hour in 1957, and it was increased to a dollar an hour in 1959. So what kind of wage an hour law existed prior to 1957? So prior to that, there was uh, the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, which was enacted in 1938. Is that right, Dirk? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, and the Fair Labor Standards Act was part of the uh, New Deal legislation from FDR. Um, that and some of the uh, other bills that passed then, for those of you who are uh, Supreme Court nerds, um, was part of the so-called uh, switch in time that saved nine. FDR was going to pack the Supreme Court in order to get his new deal through because they kept turning every, uh, overturning every law. Uh, and towards the end of his push, they decided to change their tune on the new deal laws, which saved the nine-person Supreme Court. Uh, and the Fair Labor Standards Act was one of those acts that made it through after the Supreme Court decided to stop striking down the new deal legislation. Um, so, uh, but the Fair Labor Standards Act included child labor standards, uh, wage and hour standards, and so forth. What we're focused on here is the minimum wage. Um, and I, I unfortunately don't know a lot about labor history in terms of wage and hour before the Fair Labor Standards Act came into play. What I can tell you is that the original Fair Labor Standards Act had a lot of very large exceptions to it that were slowly filled in over time. Uh, and then states began adopting their own wage and hour laws to supplement it, um, to deal with some local conditions that weren't covered by Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, and over time, those two laws have diverged a bit. For a very long time, Vermont stayed very close to the federal minimum wage. And now we've, we're more than $3.50 apart from the federal minimum wage, um, which is probably close to, if not the largest gap that we've had in history from that, that dollar amount. Um, so from 1959 through 2016, our nominal, nominal minimum wage increased by an average of 4.6% per year. But when you adjust for inflation by the Consumer Price Index, the minimum wage increased by an average of only 0.8% per year. Uh, and actually, if you adjust by other inflation figures, it was closer to 0%. Um, so it just depends on how you measure inflation for some of these things. Um, so what's the policy behind all of this? Uh, the public policy declared in the chapter, in section 381, is that workers in any occupation should receive wages sufficient to provide adequate maintenance and protect their health and to be fairly commensurate with the value of the services rendered. That language is unchanged from 1957. So that was the original expressed policy intent of the legislature uh, in the act. So. Um, Inadequate maintenance has a synonymous with being able to pay your bills I mean, it's, it's now used very infrequently, but. Yeah, so um, it's hard for me to say exactly what, without doing a lot of sort of digging, exactly what they were getting at. Um, but you could certainly interpret it as adequate to pay your bills, to maintain a livable, a standard of living. Um, and uh, again, to protect their health would seem to be sort of complementary. Um, but it's not clear whether they were intending that an individual working X number of hours a week at the minimum wage should be able to make, you know, this particular standard of living or whether they were anticipating that, uh, you know, you're looking at multiple adults working or what. Um, and so that's, that's something where uh, certainly 
adequate maintenance and protection of health seemed to indicate some sort of minimum standard of living, uh, but it's hard to say what that was without bringing ourselves back in time to the 1950s. Um, and it's, uh, I would say, even with what we have at the archives, we're unlikely to get a really good sense of that because uh, just so much of what happened in these rooms back then was not recorded. Um, so uh, even when you go back and pull the files out, you might get a couple scribbled notes, but there's no context and it's hard to tell what people were thinking. And actually with, uh, I can't remember if it was the 1957 bill or the 1959 bill, if you look at the journal uh, for when it came out in, I uh, can't remember if it was the House or the Senate that advanced it, but the Committee of Jurisdiction actually recommended it, voted it out unfavorably, uh, but then the body overruled them and passed it. So uh, that is something you almost never see, um, but they were apparently asked to bring it to the floor, so they did, but with a committee vote against the bill, and then the bill subsequently passed. So. Okay. Um, so I want to be conscious of my time, and I don't have a clock, so... 204. Perfect. Um, what do you want to... Clock? I'll warn you. I'm like, no. Just at, at quarter past. No, go ahead. Just like... Um, and then... <laughs> oh, perfect. That would be great. Thank you, Ron. And then, Jamie, when you get in there, if it's, you know, if you have an impression of how long you... If you get a sense of how long you may be, I have a feeling I'm going to be drafting an amendment this afternoon. Yeah. So, yeah, so you yeah, it's a chunk of it's drafted, but um, depending on what happens during their conversation with Commissioner Pichak and um, during subsequent conversations, I may have a lot of, it may become a lengthy amendment. All right, they're, you're on, they're going to call you now. Yes, Okay. that sounds great. So coverage is for employers employing two employees or more. Uh, so, and that, again, is unchanged from the original 1957 language. Um, so uh, then we get into, this is one of the really interesting areas of the bill here, and I'm omitting a chunk of the definition section here uh, and focusing really on the the most um, interesting section here. So first is, so an employee is any individual who's employed or permitted to work by an employer. And before I move on, this is an important thing because it's saying employers, it's not just if you have a direct employer-employee relationship where you hired the individual, it's someone that you're permitting to work. Uh, and the goal of this was to address, this was actually a common feature uh, back uh, in the teens and 20s where employers would try to get around early efforts at workplace legislation by saying, well, I'm not the employer. All I did was hire Joe from down the street and said, I need some shirts made. And Joe hired 20 kids who are in here running the looms, but I don't actually employ those kids, so the fact that one of the kids got injured, it's not my fault. Um, and I have no responsibility for them. So this is basically saying, look, if you permit someone to work in your place of business, you have a responsibility to make sure that uh, they're paid minimum wage. Now, obviously, in the days of independent contractors and subcontractors, it's often the subcontractor who has to pay their employees or the contractor who's paying their employees. But um, this is to put it in there to get some ability to go after people who are trying to sidestep the laws uh, to avoid paying minimum wage. Um, so any individual employed in agriculture, and in just a second we'll talk about what exactly is agriculture, but this is an important one. Agricultural work is generally excluded from our minimum wage, and it is also excluded under the Fair Labor Standards Act, with some exceptions, which we could probably spend a day on. Um, but we'll go into the general definition. 
Uh, the next is any individual employed in domestic service in or about a private home. And we're gonna talk about this too, um, but this is what I like to refer to as the babysitter exception, um, because this is what makes it so you don't have to comply with wage and hour laws when uh, you have a babysitter. Um, so agriculture, and we don't have a definition of agriculture in our statutes. So what I'm doing here is reaching to, in our wage and hour statutes, we have several definitions of agriculture elsewhere that vary depending on the statute. So uh, in general, when we don't have a definition, we can look to the Fair Labor Standards Act for guidance, um, although ultimately the interpretation of our law for enforcement purposes falls on these gentlemen from the Department of Labor. Um, but we can look to the Fair Labor Standards Act to get an idea of what we're dealing with here. Uh, and then if a question came up about what agriculture is, the Department of Labor would make a determination about whether that particular instance fell under the exception. So in the case of this where there's no definition of agriculture in the minimum wage law, and that presumably this language is, was created, if not changed, since 1957. Would would labor? You can just nod your head, yes or no. Would, but would labor go back to 1957 to see what definitions existed then, or would they use more modern definitions that might have been added since then? So I, I'll defer to Dirk here for to start. Yes, this answer. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dirk Anderson with the Department of Labor. Um, in determining what agriculture is today, if we were to look at the minimum wage exemption in, in um, the context of a complaint, um, we would we'd have to reconcile the current definition under federal law, I think, with all of Vermont's various um, definitions of agriculture. As Damien says, there are many, depending you know, which, which green book you're looking in. Um, so it would, it would be a case by case analysis. Yeah. But we wouldn't, yeah, we, we wouldn't be originalists. We wouldn't say this was what, this is what agriculture meant in 1957. Right, which is a key point, because some of this language that is the vestige of 1957 that hasn't been changed, there are definitely some differences in how we define so no, that's good to know. I mean, it's, it's so like employee elsewhere in statutes, we would make a dis somewhere along the lines there would be a policy decision made, whether it was here as a statute or there in 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 the department to choose the closest one, or to create one. I think what they, I think what Dirk's trying to say is that they would they would take a look at federal law, they'd take a look at state law and try to find the the most accurate definition for it in the context of Vermont. Um, so the and you know the other thing to keep in mind too is that the wage and hour law is a remedial law. So it's written to remedy underpayment of workers. Uh, to ensure that they get a minimum wage. And so when you're construing it, you tend to construe the law for the benefit of the worker, which we've talked about in the context of the student uh, wage exemption, where instead of the, construing the definition of student as broadly as possible, the Department of Labor construed students working during all or part of the school year to mean secondary school students working during the actual school year and not the break between school years. Uh, and so again, they're, they're looking at what's protective of employees unless the legislature has indi indicated otherwise. Um, so that would be some of the context there. But, um, you know, it's, I think the important thing to remember too is that it's, this sort of interpretation comes up when there is a complaint or a claim brought to the department and then they have to look in the context of that case and the facts of that case to make a determination about those facts and then interpret the law based on, on the facts in front of them and whether how the law might apply to those facts. So um, we could do a lot of speculating here, okay. but the, the bottom line is I think that you know they would look to other 
parts of state law and to the federal wage and hour laws. So for our purposes, what I've done is just kind of given you an idea of where the federal wage and hour law is on agriculture and on domestic service. Um, I did not check with DERP to see if the departments have rulings on these issues in the past. So there may be other context here, but just for purposes of putting this together, we focused on this. So for federal purposes, agriculture includes farming and all of its branches, um, cultivation of soil, dairying, uh, growing or harvesting any agricultural or horticultural commodity that should have been included before the ellipses, um, the raising of livestock, bees, fur-bearing animals, poultry, and any practices including forestry and lumbering uh, performed by a farmer or on a farm as an incident to or in conjunction with such farming operations, including preparation for market, delivery to storage or to market, or to carriers for transportation to market, and without going too far off the beaten track, this question about forestry or lumbering operations performed by a farmer or on a farm as an incident to uh, or in conjunction with the farming operations has come up in other contexts uh, outside of wage and hour law. And then the question becomes, if there's a farmer running a lumbering operation, is that the same as if there's a farmer who's doing forestry to maintain a sugar bush or to, uh, to uh, maintain the edges of pasture land or to expand pasture land. Um, and these are things where um, you, know, you again would need to look at case law and other interpretations in the past. Um, so and my, my recollection of this comes up from when I was a law clerk and we had a zoning case about whether someone was entitled to the agricultural exemption for uh, an organ shop that they ran on the family farm and used lumber from the farm for the organ shop, uh, and whether the planing and sawmilling operations at that outbuilding that they constructed counted as an agricultural practice and were therefore exempt from zoning. So. But that's way of, way far afield from this, but um, very interesting case. Representative Trice. Uh, uh, with um, um, cutting of timber to supplement winter income on, on within the farm or on the farm, is that, is that included, do you think, would that be? It's hard for me to say. Okay. Uh, and I don't think I'm prepared to answer that. It was quite a tradition for a long time. Right. Um, and that, I think, is part of what you look at is this an established regular farming practice, mm -hmm. or is this a different industry altogether that yeah. we don't consider part of farming? Yeah. Okay. But these are things that the department would face if a question mm -hmm. came up, but it's, and if it's something that you would need to consider if you wanted to put in an express definition. Um, and I should say that this is the definition of agricultural for the federal purposes, but they have an entire subchapter of the Code of Federal Regulations devoted to what is agriculture and what is not, uh, which is longer this, than this entire bill or our entire minimum wage chapter by itself. So I have to ask a question about, does this include value-added product yeah, yeah. made on the farm? So Yeah, I mean, there are cases about when, after something has left the farm, is it no longer part of the farming operation? What if they put the cannery on the farm? So on and so forth. Yeah. So, um, Okay, all right. So domestic service. Uh, this is again, we're looking at, this is from the Fe Code of Federal Regulations. Um, so, and this is basically saying, what are these domestic services that are not covered? And it includes services by, performed by employees such as companions, babysitters, cooks, waiters, butlers, valets, maids, housekeepers, nannies, nurses, janitors, etc. going on. Um, so some of these are services that many of us would be familiar with, like babysitters or potentially a housekeeper. Others are services that I imagine most of us have never had the pleasure of experiencing, <laughs> such as a butler, <laughs> butler, valet, or a chauffeur of automobiles for family use, which I am looking forward to that day. <laughs> um, you are one. 
Yeah. Right. Um, but anyway, so uh, it also includes home health aids, personal yeah. care aids, mm -hmm. um, things that we come across in Gardeners. in right. our work. Mm -hmm. And so this is under federal regulations, mm -hmm. and again. Under our statute, we don't define domestic service. And to the best of my knowledge, um, there are instances that are covered here where our, so I shouldn't say to the best of my knowledge, but there are instances that are covered here that our state might want to cover, uh, where this job is no longer performed by someone who lives in the household with the family. Uh, and would be otherwise exempt. But this is another example where this is the definition, but then the federal government has gone much further and defined all sorts of exceptions and instances when it doesn't apply because they're trying to prevent people who, for example, pay a cleaning service to come in or pay someone on an hourly basis a couple times a month. And I'm, I'm using this as an example without knowing for sure that this is an exception just to be clear, but they're, they're addressing instances where they say this exception doesn't apply. So, um, well, the last sentence of this really gets to that point, which is... Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, but again, this is just kind of grind, grounding you in a little bit of an idea of what the possible universe you're dealing with could be. Um, and again, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have any rulings on that, but I haven't had a chance to talk to Dirk about this. So if this is something the committee wants to pursue, you'll definitely want to hear from the Department of Labor and then take a closer look at the regulations and some of the case law around this to decide if there are things you would want to include or exclude, or if you just want to leave the language as is and wait for the cases to come up. And just, again, to be clear, this isn't someone who says, I have a maid service, I will come to your house and I will invoice you, that you're not an employee then. Right, so but then. If I, if I hire two people, if they're an employee under the two-person employee definition, um, I can pay these folks the federal minimum wage, is that right? I still have to pay them that, or are they exempt from that even? So. My understanding, um, and my understanding is that there is some exclusion for domestic service under the Fair Labor Standards Act. I would need to go back and really look closely at what the requirements are because, in the context of this, I just haven't had a chance to do that. Okay. Um, so, the but for purposes of our statute. Uh, We'll use, for example, the babysitter analogy, where it's someone who comes to your house occasionally, performs babysitting duties for you. Uh, you don't have to comply with the wage and hour statutes for that individual. Um, at least according to this, they're not considered an employee for purposes of the statute. So record keeping and so forth. You don't have to keep records of every time I've had my neighbor's daughter over to babysit for my daughters. Um, you know, and I fortunately don't have to file reports with the Department of Labor. Um, although we do pay above minimum wage, I just want to emphasize <laughs> yeah. that. I was just thinking that. I was like, I don't know how many babysitters they are going to be. Children are priceless. Yeah. Well, I, I actually have to say, when she first started babysitting for us, she said, oh, I'm happy to do it, but I forget what amount she said. And it was like below minimum wage. I was like, I don't feel really right doing that. So, because you can earn minimum wage at your regular job. So, anyway, that's that's another thing. Right. So that's just, just. I mean, that's. I, th I think this is illustrative of the complexity of sentences that don't have backup to them. Right, and we've got a bunch of those in our exceptions. So those those were two of the ones that are a little meatier. Um, the next one is in any individual employed by the United States, so uh, we don't tell the federal government what to pay its employees. Um, and this was, this also originally included an exemption from the minimum wage for state employees uh, and an exemption for employees of the political subdivisions of the state. 
Um, so that would be towns and counties. Um, towns and counties lost their exemption in 1977. The state lost its exemption in 1993. Um, now the state has to pay minimum wage. So um, just a little tidbit. So the next is any individual employed in the activities of a public supported nonprofit organization except laundry employees, nurses, aides, or practical nurses. I could not tell you what a public supported nonprofit organization is within the meaning of the original act. I have done some research on this and have not been able to figure that out. Uh, I'm continuing to look into it to see if I can figure it out. I'm not sure if you found an answer to this, Dirk. I have been trying to find an answer to that for years. Um, there appears to be no legislative history on it. Yeah. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, the department has never um, further defined that or allowed any business or employer to pay some minimum wage based on the invocation of that particular exemption yeah. prop because we really don't know what it means. So I see that you got a signal to go. Yeah, so I'm close to the end of this section, so why don't I just finish it up and then I'll stop. And the only thing I could conjecture based on conversations that we had and it was conjecture was rent a training facility, probably retreat, Waterbury State Hospital, and, you know, elements that might have laundry employees, nurses aides or practical nurses, but that still isn't any, that, that's just a conjecture, that's just, um, you know, I, what was a, were there such things as 501c3s in 1957? I'm sure the language hasn't changed that much, so. Yeah, I'll, I would have to look back. Yeah, but. Um, the other thing to note with this is that the original language also included an exemption for employees subject to the FLSA. Um, and it's, it's in your statutes there. If you look back at the notes for 383, it'll show you the language that was deleted um, back in 1967. Uh, and I think what it said is except laundry employees, nurses aides, practical nurses, or employees who are otherwise subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, meaning they're otherwise covered by the federal minimum wage. That was taken out, I presume, because it's super superfluous. Um, although, well, not superfluous, but because it would basically exempt almost everybody because we cover pretty much everyone the same. And now that our minimum wage is separated from the federal, um, that would create some issues. But Again, it doesn't provide any insight into what they were going for here when they enacted this. This is probably the one exemption in here for me that's the most difficult to rationalize and figure out how it applies. Um, so the last couple here, um, individual employed in an executive, administrative, or professional capacity, these are the folks outside of state government that you commonly hear referred to as exempt employees. They're exempt from the minimum wage and hour laws. Um, managerial employees, professional employees like lawyers, etc. cetera. Um, is this, they're not completely synonymous with salary though, right? There is a salary test that's part of this, uh, and this is what we talked about in the context of Representative Howard's bill a few weeks back. So. Um, Individuals making home deliveries of newspapers or advertising. This was originally, I believe, uh, what is it, home delivery newsboys or something like that. Um, that language has been modified or modernized a little bit. But basically, newspaper delivery is not subject to the minimum wage. Taxi cab drivers, not subject to the minimum wage. I do not know whether this applies to Uber drivers or Lyft drivers if they were determined to be an employee, which is also a question that the department has done some work on and I believe uh, under certain circumstances would define them as independent contractors, um, provided they meet certain standards. But again, I don't know if uh, someone who's working on a ride sharing app who was determined to be an employee would be subject to this. Um, uh, and then outside salespersons, this is basically someone who's probably earning commission. 
um, going door to door. Um, and then finally, students working during all or any part of the school year or regular vacation periods. We've talked about this in the context of S23. Uh, originally, it was students attending school and working part time. Uh, that was amended in 1959. Um, and then the original 1957 law also included an exemption for any switchboard operator employed in a public telephone exchange which has not more than 750 stations. Wow. I assume that this became obsolete as we got automatic telephone switchboards, um, which I learned all about while I was putting this together. Very interesting stuff. Um, but uh, I. Still, I'm not entirely sure what they are referring to by stations. I assume that that is like end number codes uh, for folks there. Um, but that is it. So I will return to you guys uh, whenever I next have a chance to yeah, start I mean, 384. Get, yeah, when you get settled in next door, just give us an idea if you think you're going to be done at all. I doubt it. So. Um, so. So we'll pick up tomorrow. We'll also pick up on how you can from okay. you are free. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you're exempt. Yeah, and then we will have to, we have time tomorrow, depending on how the floor is. I didn't look at the notice calendar today. Um, to catch up on H107, again, we have to we have to hear what the changes are on paid family leave and vote on those, both the um, Ways and Means Committee version and the and the appropriations version of the bill. And that'll be sometime, we'll try to fit that in tomorrow. We have time in the morning at 11. 15, yeah. Do you want to stay up um, No, we can go off the record. So this is also a prelude um, to this this work through. Um, I've asked Damien to do a presentation coming up when we have time on our labor laws. All that we have several different labor laws that talk about public sector unions, and we're going to have a we're going to have an education on that. Um, simply because at some point we'll be asked to understand how state employees are paid, how it works through the Pay Act, um, what the different state public sector unions are, why they're different, uh, where they're similar. Um, so that, that's, that's part of our larger portfolio. And, and so we'll get, a, we'll get a presentation from Damien on that when things from from family medical leave insurance settled down, which will be this week, um, presumably. Um, the other news of note is that um, Deanna and her partner, the baby was born this weekend. Oh my um, gosh. But it's still anyone. touch and go. I mean, it's very, very neonatal. And what I heard this morning from Representative Chestnut Tangerman was that the baby's we had a tough day yesterday, um, but we may not see Representative Gonzalez for quite some time with the rest of this, um, just for that reason. Well, I mean, if, if, if the baby, if the baby's 10 weeks or eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks premature, so um, they are they are, they are working it and, and really trying to make it, the doctors are working hard, so um, we'll keep Keep her in her thoughts and keep her in her family in her thoughts. And, uh, is baby in Burlington? In Burlington, yeah. Um, so let's take a half an hour now just to chillax and, um, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about what we're hearing about minimum wage. I think, I think the rest of the day is going to be pretty light because of what's happening next door. Okay. So then tomorrow morning we will have testimony on minimum wage from um, advocates and, and business owners. So uh, we'll get right back into it. Thank you. Thank you.
I, I just wanted to I, I kind of wrap up the day. I don't know if we want to talk about what we've heard so far or just continue on a kind of a learning process about about S23 and about minimum wage. I don't know if there's anything else we want to add right now. Um, we are going to hear a lot tomorrow from advocates and from business owners in the morning. And we'll probably schedule some folks in tomorrow afternoon um, as well. Um, so I don't know if anybody had any you know initial thoughts or if we just want to hold it till we you know hear more and because I don't I don't think we have a lot that's just to sift out yet. Um, Joyce's work will Joyce's work is there. We'll return to it before we finish the conversation, so we'll have a better context of what what we're talking about. Tommy, anything in comparison to last year? That uh, well, I, I like that Joyce has, you know, upgraded the uh, the information. It, it's different from the last time that we look at that. Uh, no, I, su I suspect tomorrow we'll hear many of the same arguments we heard last time. So probably not a lot of new under the sun. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering if you're aware of anybody trying to offer any amendments on on any of it on on minimum it, wage. Yeah, on changing the the length of the time or the changing mm -hmm. the fifteen dollars to something else. Or well, no one would go out of their way to tell me about that. Oh, that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. They, um, they just, no, I have not heard that there's a different that there's a different length. Um, I have not heard anything else about the, and we'll hear more before we're done on the child care portion. We'll hear more on the tip portion. Um, yeah. We'll hear more uh, on all, and then and then the study. Um, the reason I want to hear more about these exemptions. The question is, it, do we? talk more about this in the study because we can't change we don't have the time to change anything about, about ag if there's a book that's this thick about describing what agriculture is we're not going to change the exemption on agriculture the question is do you start to include it in the summer study committee this year or do you wait a different time but because mm -hmm. um, the summer study that's proposed in the bill is to talk about paid um, youth wage and the tip wage. So, you know, we'll just decide as we hear the testimony. But I wanted to, I wanted to, we don't usually talk about the whole statute, you know, and I wanted to bring out this whole statute because I think that the exemptions and the exemptions to time and a half, which is the next section that Damien will go through, it's just important to understand that you know, just because we're changing the minimum wage as a whole, what is it? What is it impact? And we haven't. I mean, for all the years that we've done this bill in this committee, we haven't really expanded that thinking. Um, I won't go so far as to say that that agriculture needs or wants to have their minimum wage laws changed, but if we do, we need their input. That's a big. That's a big chunk of. Conversation because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the basis of their economy, mm -hmm. and so, and though they may be paying, though most people may be paying the, the Vermont minimum wage, having the ability to pay less than that is, is important to the to the business structure of a lot of these farms. So, we're not in any position to change that without any input, but. We're certainly going to get a lesson and see how broad this this statute is, and um, get an get an idea of how antiquated some of the language is, and, and decide whether we want to do anything this year or next year on it. And, uh, well, for me, it's very bracing to see the exemptions that the, the agriculture and the home workers or whatever, you know. And they, it seems so outdated. Not that we should change it, but I think to include them in the study so that we can understand them. 
seems really right to me because my first blush is it looks so racist that those two things are excluded. And, you know, it's people, migrant workers are working on the farms in many instances, so we, I, I don't really understand the reality there. Mm -hmm. And then also this healthcare workers are in homes now, it's not just babysitters, it's, that, it's such a broad from servants and, you know, um, and, you know, we can joke about we don't have people like that, but some people do. And do those people have a voice? And so not, so I think that including those exemptions in a study makes a lot of sense without saying that it's changing and because there's not enough information to really, to understand it yet. And, but to keep hiding it, you know, every chapter that we try to address it seems, I don't know, moral is the right word, but I just, it makes me a little queasy to well, ignore it. Right, and it's, there's so much in, in our statute that's ancient. You know, again, we passed the law to get rid of offensive language because it still existed throughout the statute years ago. And, you know, the, but, you know, if the federal definition of agriculture is however this thick, mm -hmm. you know, and then, I mean, we know from our earlier testimony that, like, employees and employers are defined differently in many different statutes. There's not one, you know, there's just not one definition of that. And there's reasons for it, it but it is confusing to say, well, which employer definition, which employee definition are you talking about today? And today we're talking about the ones who are exempt, you know, that 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 employee that we're talking about that receives a minimum wage may fit under those other employee categories as well. But in this particular case, specifically about minimum wage, these are the people we're talking about. And so I don't even know how many people who are tipped workers anymore. Outside of servers or restaurants. I mean I mean who's who's on the list? And I we got something from Matt Barrowitz. I don't think it has that answer in it. But like, who, who are the tip workers? I just don't know. Valets, you know, butlers, caddies, you know, catering staff, chambermaids. Yeah. Are there any chambermaids left? And the answer is yes, somewhere. So, housekeeping. Yeah. But they, I don't think but they're exempt be, from. That should be a tipped position. That should be a flat I don't position. think it is. I'm not sure it is. That's why I was about to ask. Yeah. I think that's a salary position. Well, right, but some of the hotel chains, I mean, I always leave a couple dollars per yeah. night when I stay. Yeah, so do I. And some of those smaller, or not smaller, but lower scale places are, they're working back and they're, t they're taking those tips and using them to, to spread the, sa to spread yeah. the salary thing out. Yeah. And again, it, there's a situation that's just like, wait a minute, I, if I leave $5 does that, and that person doesn't get it, yeah. you know, or they get a dollar of it, or they get a dollar from this room and this room and this room. I mean, I just, that's unclear. Um, you know, should, should those people be exempt I mean, again, I don't know who's, and I don't know, I think Matt Barrowitz is saying that they can't tell you, tell us who tipped employees are either. So, mm -hmm. so there's this broad definition of people who are hotel, motel, recreation, and restaurant workers. And you're like, uh, you know. So I think generally, federal government has guidelines for what it considers definitions of workers who's included and so on. And so the states have to follow that guideline. They can exceed it, but they can't, they can't change, at least that's my understanding, they can't change definitions or include or exclude people that have already been defined by the federal government and, and not make changes in the same way as we can as a state. We can tweak in some ways Medicaid. But basically, we cannot, even though we pay 40% um, into the Medicaid, the federal government pays 60%, supports it, but we're restricted by their guidelines as to what we can do. So I think it's this, 
follow suit. So it's it's well that's that's a question to have. I mean, for protected classes, the federal government only has five or six, and we have twelve or thirteen. Yeah. But in the in the we pay a higher minimum wage than their than the FSL the FLSA. But again, when you have a book that's this thick, a federal book that's this thick that describes what an agricultural what agriculture means right. or what domestic service means, um, our choices then are do we say as described in USC twenty five ba 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 ba, which means that we have that which means that we need to know this much, or is it something different and you know, clearly let the legislature in the past, I think, probably just relied on what the federal law was. By not stating it, you're relying on the federal law. Well, so you can't do it, you can't say anything or do anything contrary to federal law. So um, yeah, generally speaking, I think that's right, yeah. So if the federal government says these people are, this is a definition, these people are included, these people are excluded, I don't know how much <coughs> wiggle room there is for We could probably state. include more. I mean, we could probably do more positive change than negative. But again, it's, I mean, to have the attorney for the Labor Department who's been there forever say, I've never come across this, or we've never been able to answer that question, or, you know, it's, it may be that two weeks from now we say, yeah, let's, you know, what can we do? You know, what can we pass out of here? What can we pass out of the House? What can be passed by the Senate? Um, we'll make those determinations as, as time goes on. But right now, it's just learning that these are, this is, these are, these are the rules in the state of Vermont today. Right. So I had a chuckle on a, on a little bit of a lighter side. <laughs> I had a chuckle as state workers and minimum wage and I'm thinking, we're state workers, and we get paid a salary while we're here. Hmm. But we're here four and a half months a year, but we work 12 months. Because when we're not here, we're still on call. And when things come up, as with our constituents, Don't do the math we, have to, we have to respond. <laughs> yeah, I Don't think do the math. I, I know. Um, when, I, when I first came here, my first, my first term, one of the legislators jokingly said, well, you know what, if you took all the hours that we spend in the State House and then you tack on the hours that we work when we're not in the State House, maybe we get a dollar seventy an hour. And I thought that was very I thought it was very funny. And then uh, I completed my first session. And then the summer followed and the falls <laughs> fall followed and I said, Oh yes, he was right. <laughs> so yeah. but when they say, oh, you have Mondays off. Well, I've gone to three meetings on a Monday right. <laughs> for, you know, yeah. Oh, I was then, and if this was the only right. job that you had, then you're not going to qualify for that. There's no way that you can do six months over the last 12 months that really gets you to qualify. Um, <clears throat> so then we would be saving the state money, right, from that perspective. Well, yeah. we're a citizen legislature, so we're part-time, too. <laughs> Supposedly. I know for select board people, they're always, you know, people always used to say, wow, well, you, you want to do this, so you should be volunteering. It's like, I got paid 600 bucks a year. My father-in-law has been the mayor of their town for, oh, he's in his fourth term, so he's in, will be 16 years after this one arcs out. And I think he's on a salary of like $200 a month. Yeah, New Hampshire legislature makes way less. One hundred dollars a year. Yeah, yep. that's yeah. right. One hundred dollars a year. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. like yeah. four hundred of them in their house. Yeah. What does New Mexico get? They only meet for a month. I I don't know, but New Hampshire meets for a long time. Yeah, and only makes a little longer than we do. I think. Yeah. Total. There's very few full-time legislatures. New York. There's some, there's some New half time yeah, yeah. ones, three-quarter time. Mm -hmm. New, New York, York just. Is, it's their, 12, 12 months their pay. Yeah, like they're full time. time. Yep. Yeah, they, they just passed a pay. Plus, they get offices yesterday. and yeah. staff. What do they make? Yeah. What do they make? And all kinds of